We'd like to welcome you to another episode of the Gangsta Chronicles podcast, and I'm with my dog, Jim. Yeah. And again, for like the umpteenth week in a row, we have our special guest co-host, journalist extraordinaire, Mr. Soren Baker. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here. And live, you know, via satellite from San Francisco. Not via satellite, because he's live here in person. <laughs> JT, the bigger figure, the world's greatest hustler. Come on with it. Salute. Happy to be here. For sure, for sure, man. Do me a favor, brother. Grab the mic a little bit more towards you if you can. We want to make sure we definitely hearing everything you yes, can. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Make sure we hearing everything you can. So, you know, we've been talking about these top 50 gangster rap albums of all time. We will kind of put that on pause this week because we do have a special guest in the house. First thing I want to ask you, man, is where did you develop your work ethic? Um, I'm born and raised San Francisco, Fillmore District. Um, I come up under Rapid Forte, Hugh MC, uh, as the forefathers in my neighborhood. Um, learning the independent game, coming from where I'm from, I gotta say Too Short E40 as the pioneers of, I'm pressing up my own product and I'm putting it out myself. Mm -hmm. So that was my first example of my pursuit in this independent game was that I had to create the product, which was recorded, and then I had to get the money to manufacture. Manufacturing my first product was in June 1992, and I always remember the price. I paid $649 for 500 cassettes mm -hmm. that were duplicated at this place called Music Annex in the Bay Area. And I never knew that manufacturing, you, pay, you can pay. Mm -hmm. But back then, I wanted a record deal because I thought the record label pressed up the tapes. I didn't know there was a, a, a plant that they hire. So I got that knowledge at a young age. So that was my first order, pressing up my own 500 tapes. At that time, a cassette tape was $10. Mm -hmm. So um, to make the inserts, I paid maybe 250 more dollars. I used a Polaroid camera. This is all independent, this is my independent beginning. When I seen that I did this myself, it, it put the confidence in me of what I heard E-40 and Too Sure doing, but as a teenager, I paid for this. It ain't a bunch of tapes, but that one time pressing, mm -hmm. four months later, I dropped another tape. And this time, it was uh, 14 songs. These 14 songs, now I had my big homie, since I put this 500 out in the hood messing with me, I give you the money to press up 5,000 tapes. Mm. So the 5,000 tapes, now I got a full color wrapped in plastic cassette tape. Uh, I went to In A Minute, in a minute uh, or a Music People Distribution, mm -hmm. and then Walter Zelnick at City Hall Distribution. These was the two points that if you get your product there, it can go to the stores. Mm -hmm. But before um, just going to the distributor, I knew where record stores was at myself. So for me to go sell 100 cassette tapes for $500, but I paid less than a dollar for the cassette tape. But to make $5 per unit, so I'm looking at $25,000 potentially off of 5,000. My big homie loaned me probably 7,000. I was able to give him back his 7,000 with, with another five added on, so he got 12,000 out to 25. I don't think I made the whole 25 because I was giving some out. Mm -hmm. But the concept for a teenager to make $25,000 legally, mm -hmm. that is what I think stuck with me throughout all my years that no matter if I get a deal or not, I learned the secret of let me go press my own. Mm -hmm. And then that same concept went to when I make films, shoot my own film, and I got to print up DVDs. Back then it was VHS, then it went to DVDs. Mm -hmm. So it was like cassette tapes, then now a, DVD, a CD cost in the store, $16, but to manufacture was $1.25. So just 1,000 CDs is $1,200. That's how, that's how we did our, our math, like a drug dealer. Even if I don't have enough to press up a lot, if I need to pay my rent or if I'm behind, I can remember I don't have a job, so let me make a new project and go just sell a certain amount of copies to get the money. Mm -hmm. And then a CD, getting half the money was the, the concept. If I take it to the store, I'm getting $8. Mm -hmm. 
So a thousand discs, I can make eight thousand, and I'm selling my whole thousand pack because I ain't got no room no more to give them out for free mm -hmm. to get my name going. Once you your name, the fan base. Once you got just any kind of fan base, I said I could feed this to this population to keep some money. This would kept me from drugs. And this would make me have so many different albums and joint albums and compilations because every one of them represented a certain amount of money as soon as I print them up. Yo, hold on one second. So that, that, uh, that, that hustling, grinding, do-it-yourself concept, and I got to give credit to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan because he had the Brothers of the Nation of Islam coming out and that's when I start seeing the brothers with the papers on the corner, the pies, and but they would always say something about uh, do for self, black man, start a business, black man. You like you know telling the young people that, mm -hmm. but you know we in the streets, we hustling. You know I'm right. part time rapping, I'm still trying to sell some weed, you know a little powder, try to make some coke into some rocks or something, but it never worked good for me. The music worked it good. I remember printing up ten thousand discs. And I'm finna go pick up eighty thousand dollars, but this type of number in the streets for a kilo dealer, that's that's basic numbers. But to a teenager with discs, <laughs> I'm going to pick up kilo money. Right. Mm -hmm. Kilo guys started to look up to me, and I'm younger than them, but they had kilo money, the Benzes, the plug for the powder packs, and all you know, the weed. You know how ballers they get on. Right. Penitentiary time. But that came with penitentiary time, and the minister said. Brothers, you are being used as a distributor for drugs, but instead of a kilo of cocaine, how about you cook a kilo of yourself? Look at yourself as the kilo. That means you have to create a product that you can sell yourself, whether that's selling dinner plates and you know how to make your chicken or your fish mm -hmm. taste good. Some people have a barbecue grill that been having smoked. It been 10,000 barbecues been in there. This, when they cook in here, it have a taste. Mm -hmm. People buy that barbecue, they know when I buy this plate for the 10 or the 15 or the 20. Mm -hmm. The same concept of making an album that I'm making in my mom's house, in my bedroom. I didn't put my bed out. I don't have no furniture. All I got is studio equipment in this room and I sleep on the floor because I'm so excited that if I, this next album I'm making, I got access to make some thousands. Mm -hmm. So the concept of just doing it yourself, I gotta say Minister Farrakhan and the brothers, when I heard them say, instead of cook a kilo of dope, cook a kilo of yourself. Did you know black men, brothers, did you know that you full of talent and all your ideas is the money. The money, not the money, it's your idea. That's the money. That's the currency. Like literally that concept, I say, damn, okay. He say, do you know um, when you pray to God for something that he might give it to you in the dream, but you still got to fulfill it. Mm -hmm. You might've had the dream of yourself seeing yourself, but now you might have to sleep on the floor. You might have to sleep, you know, you might have to, uh, Wash dishes, you might have to work at McDonald's. You might can't hang on the block no more. Why? My dream's so important, I can't gamble selling dope right now to go to the pen. In 1993, you get caught with a 50 shot, a crack in San Francisco, you could do five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. when, when, when Bill Clinton and, and that, uh, uh, Hillary Clinton made that thing or something about from powder to crack or something, man, I said, I'm, a, I'm out. I could, I could sell. I could sell a thousand discs and make eight thousand. Now that's ninety three. Ninety two I made my mind up when I made them first five hundred cassette tapes. When I sold that and I probably made about maybe eighteen, nineteen hundred. But I, I literally doubled my money right. from my studio time and then the fifteen hundred or the seventeen hundred that my homeboy gave me, because I'm like, I'm not selling dope. I'm gonna ask somebody who got the money to help me to pay for my stuff. When I was able to pay them back. Then one of my other homeboys came and said, let me give you more money because I want to be part of your new album. Mm -hmm. But I knew I wanted to be on my own label, though. So I learned from Suge Knight, Harry O, Dr. Dre. I, I looked at the components. I looked at the movie Crush Groove, Russell Simmons. His brother is a rapper. He don't got the money. His family don't believe in him. But he bought 5000 from JB. 
But he didn't pay JB back on time in the movie, and he was getting beat up all through the movie. So I learned from that movie, if you borrow the money, you got to pay the money back. You got to get a scratch. I don't know what he was thinking about. They had already got some money. Mm -hmm. JB was like, I want to be part of the deal now. I'm part of the whole thing now. Yeah, for sure. So the concept, that's the movie that taught me get the money back. Mm -hmm. That's the movie taught me don't play with somebody who even trusts you, even if it is a long shark. If you agree to the terms, pay accordingly. Because each person that gave me some money, I had to have a conversation and an understanding. And it wasn't on contract. It's whatever we say right now, that's yeah. the deal. Words, that's how I go. Boy, the listen. Yeah. So in my yeah. hood, I didn't do no plan, but I was trusted. If JT need money for something, any one of y'all could get JT some money, and he going to bring back that plus something for you. And I'm pretty sure some of them ballers up there in Frisco saw how you was just getting that money without the stress attached. Because when you sell dope, you can't sleep at night. That's the part of the dream that I had of wanting to be like, damn, I want to be like big bro now, man. They got the packs, they, you know, the money coming in, they got the, the guns. Is, yeah, they got everything. I that think looked that'd be, it. That'd be every nigga, little nigga's vision in the hood. Man, when you see I, the big time nigga. It's like, man, shit, you don't be like, I want to be the doctor, the lawyer, and none Hell of that. Hell nah. Like shit, them niggas down the block got it all. That's and shit. exactly that. Just, just, and like you say, that's in every black neighborhood. Whoever was popping with the packs, and I won't end on that. I want to, mm -hmm. but then I started to see the avenue of people that will say, "Well, I don't want to have to wait to hustle." I'm going to break in a baller house. Right. I'm going to break in the, st the stash spot. Or he been fronting him and shit, we going to get on him. Mm -hmm. Because we know you getting it from him. That's the only reason why you got it. So that concept of breaking the house and find your riches and start your career. But there was groups of guys, and i never forget, this made me don't want that life no more. A group of our young generation, 16, 17, 18, they hit a nigga that's probably 30, 28, or a little older, whatever. Right. But he got the money. Everybody know he balling out of control. But this group of seven or eight broke in the spot, hitting for about four kilos, about 100 bands, some guns, some jewelry, and whatever other little stuff. They get away with it. These dudes all go buy cars. Mm. None of them had the money. And it was that, it was known. These the dudes that did it. Right. One by one, he killed them niggas. All of them. Or sent somebody to kill. However it went until all of them was dead. Bro, this man killed all them dudes. And the hood never, you know, I'm pretty sure their family won't get back, whatever. But for the concept of, man, niggas hit, but you hit your own folks. Mm -hmm. And I watched that man didn't sleep till all them niggas was dead. All them cars and jewelry they had, because their name was pop. It might have been a little bit more. Because they all was able to buy cougars and and Skylarks with candy paint now. And nigga, where did you get candy paint money? How did you buy such and such car? Mm -hmm. So the word, you know it ain't no secrets world, in the street. Yeah, hell yeah. Mm -hmm. So all these niggas got money now all of a sudden? One by one. That killed my thought process of, cause I, I saw a few niggas in my hood that I felt like, well, shit, I breaking this shit. That ain't the move. So I stayed on the music. But I watched others hit licks and become, you know, the guy that we wanted to become. They got bricks now, they got the weed, they got the hoes, they got the jewelry, they got the cars, they got the clout, they got the name buzzing. But the price tag for that, the music definitely kept me. And that's why I think I developed so much where people be like, bro, you just a hustling ass nigga. I say, bro, I don't sell weed, I don't sell pussy, I don't sell credit cards, I don't steal. I, I want God blessing off my talent. And sometimes, you know, the hunger kick in and things ain't going right. And then that shit do look good. The other option, the other word. Fuck it, just sell weed, it's legal. Yeah, but when you, nigga, I live in Atlanta. You know how I many Cali niggas got killed in Atlanta bringing packs? Mm. The first five they bought, it was good. The next five, it was good. The next time it's 10, it's good. It's about to be a 25 pack coming in. That's when they get killed. Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> it's, that's the that's the that's the way, and I'm pretty sure Cali niggas do them niggas when they come here thinking shit sweet or whatever. But the weed at one point was coming from right here, 
and one of them pounds down there in Atlanta was going for five thousand. So niggas saw that as the golden ticket. Hell yeah. And a lot of men it's was able the to golden it's ticket. The golden it's, ticket. It's, Until it's not. It's always the golden ticket though. Uh, coming from here with the work, going out of state somewhere, you can always double your money. So that that be the ambition of a nigga who don't. Uh, unfortunately have that talent to be an artist or whatever, you know, typical basketball nigga or yeah. football or whatever. Some niggas just, and then some niggas don't know their potential. Like you say, um, some niggas just be stuck in the neighborhood because that, that be the life to them. You know what that I'm saying? That is the life. That's the life and shit, you know. A lot of us at some point uh, was like, that's the life for me. To be the nigga down the block with all the work and, like you say, the bitches and he got all the cars and he and niggas got the nigga Dayton's was fresh out and niggas was on Dayton's tip. Candy and, paint. And you, you, your ambition is to be that nigga. Don't fucking be no, because niggas, it'll be niggas in in your in your clique or your hood, whatever, and they be like rapping, nigga, making music. Nigga, you better get with this hustling and this claim in the neighborhood and shit. So. Yeah, it's kind of difficult to set yourself apart from yes. you know from from the typical ales of of the neighborhood. You yes. feel me? You know. Go ahead, JT. Nah, that's that. I was what I was gonna say. I think I got very lucky that I always was like, I want to be a CEO. I want to be like Suge Knight. I want to be like goddamn E Forty. I want to be like Too Short. I want to be like Ice Cube, because because this is a reality that is can happen if you pursue your shit. It happened for them. So it was like evidence. Mm. You so, feel me? So then how did the vision expand from the in a minute city hall to trying to go throughout California, throughout, you know, the Pacific Northwest? And all um, that ended up getting? I, at that point in time, you know, when cassette tapes, CDs, you could see the logo of the major label or whatever label. Right. I wanted to have one of when I seen E40 slash Jive three million dollars. He's sitting at the coffee table with his feet up. I'm like, God damn it! Mm -hmm. But I ended up doing a deal with Priority for a half a million with no marketing, no distrib or only distribution, and they just gave me a shot. But I was so young, I didn't comprehend the, the workload of having a national distribution where now I got to have reps or some type of asset or communication with people in other parts of the country but back then it was no internet it was no uh hell no it was no facebook or no email you had to you, do them in store you had to the do that man you had you to had work to, <laughs> and you had to use the yellow pages and make a phone call and mm -hmm. if that didn't work you had to call the operator and say can you patch me to new york I'm looking for this record label. I'm looking for this record store. You know, can you tell me some record stores in the area? Man, that, that workload is way different than somebody workload now posting something on their page and now it's you you can get pre orders off of that. Right. Um from the world. <laughs> um expanding and wanting that once I got that distribution though with priority, I felt Good, then I felt more pressure than I ever felt because I got the dream deal, man. Dr. Dre, Chronic album came through here, you know, uh, NWA, Ice Cube, all this shit, you feel me? Jay-Z, when I signed, he signed through a company called Freeze. It wasn't even Rockefeller Records. It was Freeze through Priority. Mm. It didn't even say Rockefeller on it. And I remember him and Dame Dash first show was in Field Mall. And I got that footage, and I just, when I look at it and see the little ass change, just the beginning, they trying to get on, you feel me? Our conversation. Um, when that didn't go right, I was forced to go back to what people expected of me. JT, the bigger figure, independent. Right. So now I'm back in what I said that I wanted in the first place, but now I'm actually stuck in it. But I never lost the drive. So I continue to do different type of products, joint albums, everything independent, whatever type of collaboration, compilation. Then I start spinning over to the movies. When I see going to, doing movies in Cali, okay, it was a little baby impact. It was matter of fact, it was a big impact because Master P came out when I'm about it, and then I came out with Be Where It Owes a few months later, right. and that was the first hip hop rap 
movie with a rapper from the Bay. Right. Um, then moving to Atlanta some years later and making movies down there, that's when I got to feel like a movie star because bootlegging movies down there, they still had stores, but they were bootleg stores. Right. Some guy that got all the movies and DVDs up in here and all the albums, some of them bootleg, some of them got plastic on it, but he got his own burning machine right there. Any album you want, he can make it right on the spot. So when I would make my films, at first I was trying to sell them to the stores, right? I would come to the store, they got all my movies wrapped in plastic. They burnt them. <laughs> Back in the day, that would have, would have been a no-no. I couldn't right. press MCA album and I got it in my store. That would have been a no-no. If you would have heard if any of that going on when you was doing it, you would have had, oh yeah. It would have been, it would have been, been dangerous problem. for the person who doing it. Cause like, exactly. nigga, you actually stealing. Yeah, nigga. But then stealing became okay when they made the machines, the bootleg. A cassette tape, they didn't have bootleg cassette tape machines. We had a Panasonic with two, uh, a tape deck right here, which you're going to record, and this the one you record on, and it's high-speed dubbing. I remember that. Exactly. But you still had to wait one at a time. You feel <laughs> yeah, me? Yeah, it wasn't mass duplication yeah. at all. But once it went to D DVD or CD, and they got this tower. You put 10 of them in there, hit the button, and bzzz, pop. And now I got your whole album. They writing the name on it, put it in a little slip. So Down South made me famous with the movies. I didn't get the money at first, but I got the fame because now my product is feeding them, but they promote me. Mm -hmm. Because any new movie, the bootlegger, that, that's what they thrive yeah, for. definitely. To get it first. You actually put out something that actually became a really pivotal project for independent filmmakers. You had something to do with Snow on the Bluff. Yes, Snow on the Bluff one, somebody else did. That was the mega. But for me to redo it and rehook up with Curtis Snow and activate him back in the game and made part two and then Snoop played a part up in there, it caused big controversy. It caused lawsuits, it caused all type of shit. But for what the fact- What do you think the problem was with that? The fact of that the man ran off with all the money on Kurt for the first one, because Kurt didn't have nobody like me to talk. So we approached him about doing part two, then he started talking about all his money, but Kurt only did a deal for part one. So part two, we done. But he put in paperwork for trademarking it, and then boom, it caused copyright infringement. So I had to change the name from Snow in the Bluff 2 to Summertime in the Bluff, because it's like, it's not his movie. But by calling it part two, it tied to his movie, mm -hmm. and that caused a problem. You feel me? Who did but you do that initial project with? I'm sorry. Some dude, I don't even know his name. Some dude helped him make that. But when I made part two, that was smacking, smack dab as a continuation of what you seen in the first one. Mm -hmm. That's what boosted me as a certified filmmaker. Like JT shot that and I edited No Help. And I shot it on the iPhone. Mm. Whole movie. And y'all was on your way to making some M's with that. And, and, and Trap Flicks, that helped kick my Trap Flicks platform off. Once I did Trap Flicks, the app, I, I caught the Trap Flicks because Netflix robbed Kurt. And he was famous from Snow on the Bluff on Netflix. So I'm like, bro, we independent, man, fuck them. We gonna start Trap Flicks. And we gonna make an app like they shit. And God really blessed me to make it. I had made all these movies and had no place to take them because Netflix only offered $15,000 per film. I had 10 films that I made in, in 2014. When I made these films, I'm on fire in the streets. Mm -hmm. Either I'm doing a deal with somebody, when I got, they offer 15,000 for five years per film, that's 150,000 and don't come back and ask for no more money for five years. And I can't go nowhere else. I was like, man, I don't think you I should You know what they gonna tell you? Well, you should be happy to have your film on Netflix. That's yeah. exactly was the concept, but I'm like, I wanna actually, I'm from the, independent game like we supposed to make some money still and to just give me 150 even though I know I probably didn't even pay 5,000 per movie I probably didn't even pay two thousand dollars per movie but I knew if I sign this and set the money it's gonna be like a rapper signing a 360 deal or a right. rapper signing an artist deal you happy to get the deal you got your big check up front but you know that might be the last one for a long time and a lot of rappers have went through that so me hearing them them horror stories I just felt, I, I know these movies could be more valuable for me. 
I rejected the deal. I started Triflex. I invested into a team to build me an app. I put my movies on my app. Mm -hmm. And from there, my reputation went up as this motherfucker right here. I I'll tell you how influential it was. Um, this ain't meant to elicit no controversy or nothing, but a lot of people have taken your intellectual liberties with your intellectual property. They've taken certain liberties because I remember um, when Dame Dash first came out with his app, right? We built it. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing that like he got the technology from you and he just kind of ran off and didn't give me a dollar. Mm -hmm. I got to put him on blast and tell the truth. But I don't use that as a campaign of crying about what a nigga did to me. I made it known to the public and then I stopped. Me and Snoop had some words, but I respect Snoop and that he helped me more than hurt me. I don't know if it was his team, but once the people who did the first one on the bluff saw Trap Flicks was under Calvin Brodus and it didn't have my name, he went straight at the Snoop. He never even came back, even said a word to me. I don't know if Snoop authorized that or did his label or his management jump the gun and register the company without my name? It looked like it was about to be a money grab without me, right? But the lawsuit came and foiled it, and me and Snoop never really got to communicate as brothers again because he disappointed at the lawsuit. I'm disappointed that my name ain't on it. We both is having something to feel some kind of way about, but. I always wanted the people to know, I thank Snoop for taking me around the world multiple times, showing me how a megastar lived, showing me how a multimillionaire had to move, the do's and the don'ts. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't have nothing, and you I want to shout brother out, brother Snoop, my big bro out, and thank you for all the help mm -hmm. and teaching me the things that I do know right now and how to conduct myself. Exactly, and to be real, when you're dealing with a mega entity that is the Snoop Dogg brand, it could have been very much somebody on his team that just jumped the gun and went and did some stuff. And without, our, with us, without us having our agreement exactly. in place. Mm -hmm. And that's, that, that's what I was heard about. And um, I think when Dame Dash saw me and Snoop had that issue right there, he's like, oh, I don't got to respect JT. I'm going to just run off with this software. And he did his thing. And then I, 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 I was vocal about it for a few days. And then at a certain point, I say, man, it's going to look like I'm mad at Snoop and Dame. These two niggas I look up to, I don't like how it turned out, but I'm not that mad. And if I'm really truly JT the bigger figure, do it again then. And then some time went by, and that's how I ended up going to Africa for a number of reasons. Number one, they invited me to come and ask for me to bring my JT skills to Africa to help their young population with the independent game. Mm -hmm. They was impressed with the movies. They impressed with me making books, albums, uh, being part of so many influential people's careers, playing parts from the background. But the other part, somebody told me, JT, you know you got trap flicks. Do you know in Africa they got software guys that live in the village? Mm -hmm. And he might look poor as ever, but he can make Anything with the computer, the you got to find them. China's stealing that technology over there for them young brothers now. Nah, they definitely, they definitely, mm. they, listen, wherever knowledge is at, whoever get to it first is who going to benefit. Because a lot of times knowledge don't have the money. Right. Skill, that's like a dope-ass rapper. Some dude right now rap better than Jay-Z and Lil Baby put together and Drake. But we don't know him yet. He raw as ever. Right. Somebody know him, he ain't connected to the right person yet. That's what I found in Africa. The dudes who made my software, you would think these are just some poor guys. So how did they come to invite you? Like, how did it happen? Man, somebody, I don't know. I, I don't even know how to Africa, because I don't know nobody in Africa. But one of they uh, big people called for a delegation from Black America, entertainment, film, entertainment, entrepreneurship, uh, a basketball coach to find, to see their basketball dudes to see if they can get some type of thing or baseball, basketball. Uh, they had a doctor dude that was part of the delegation to try to bring how to help them with the malaria or different, you know, mm -hmm. illnesses, sicknesses. So 
I, I was just part of a delegation that represent music and entrepreneurship. So they did their background on me. They're like, we want him. So I'm like, shit, I want first class round trip. I want hotel, food, everything. You feel me? I wasn't charging them, but they like, we'll pay for all of that for you. We want you there bad. So when I go, I'm thinking I'm finna go over here and I'm finna hit them for some money. I end up going to a place that's really poor. I'm not finna get the bag. I'm thinking, you know, Africa, I'm knowing I heard about is rich and is poor, but I landed in the real poor. But I felt a certain kind of way, like maybe these people need me. So I asked them, how can I help? You know, I got a few dollars. I want to, you know, what can I do to help? And he called a meeting with the chiefs and uh, they came back from the meeting. He said, well, we don't want your money, but if you want to help us, we need water. Look at this place. If you could help us with a water well, all of our villages, all the tribes could benefit off this water well. I said, how much is it? It's 6,000. I said, man, I could pay for that right now. Man, I paid for that water well. Man, do you know within 24, 48 hours, a truck pull up. I see this big stick come out. I'm talking about they put a thing on it instantly, straight to the ground. I'm trying to figure out how, uh, like where the water coming, you know, a water well. I thought they dig a hole and bring the water to fill it. They're like, no, the water's under the ground. Mm. The water a thousand feet, we're really nine hundred feet. We could go three hundred feet, JT, for three thousand dollars, but the quality of the water might not be right. But if we spend the six thousand, we can go down nine thousand. I mean, nine hundred uh, feet, and that's where we could get the purest water. Probably the best water you ever had. Man, listen, I say go on, go 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 down. I want to get the good water. Man, when that water, I taste that water. I mean, it took a, it took them it took them some hours, but I'm just tripping on how they putting this metal stick down. I'm like, damn! So the water finna come out from right here in this dry ass, looking like desert type. Man, if we just had enough money to pay for all this drilling, we could have the water. I'm like, why y'all just don't do it for your people? Y'all got a truck right here, cause the truck man want money and we can't pay for it. Mm. Imagine a whole village full of people they can't afford six thousand dollars to pay for a water with. Cause they still got to buy food and they got to pay for their internet and they still got to pay their rent and it's so collectively chipping in money i would think six thousand dollars shit i see three four thousand people right there this is poor is this the yeah. real poor jt so this water you about to donate for us i say i want to put my mama name on it i want to call this mama pearls water well so I can call my mom and tell her I'm doing something good. I want her name to go on this. Mama, look, all these people finna get clean water. Now look right over here at this dirty water with goats and cows and people taking baths and different shit. They got to get this water to cook with tonight. I said, uh-uh. So I switched my, my heart from what can I get from them to, man, 6000 bro. You could blow that money in Atlanta on the weekend going to get some outfits, you know, some bottles, some sections. Like, you could blow 5000 in California. I'm pretty sure, on, on, yeah. and with nothing to show for it, mm -hmm. but to pay for that, I well, think that was do it every day. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> every day, that money disappeared into the oh, night. Fucking thirty thousand in the strip club to some naked ass like hoes nothing. and shit, like it's nothing and shit. Nothing. But won't give a dollar if you tell if you call it over there and ask them same cats, hey bro, donate five hundred dollars each. They'll look at you like you was crazy. Hell yeah, they'll look at you. You know the the the. Uh, I think in my whole life. That was the best thing up to that point that I ever did in my life. Cause I'm like, damn, this little bit of money. And they talking about this water well should last years. Not it, like the water don't run out. It's a lake up under there. Once they put that suction thing and whatever lake is under there, man, they putting that water up. When did you, you know, I want to go back to something. I want to go back to, cause we talked about Atlanta, right? The grimy side. Everywhere you went, it seemed like you purchased property. Yes, sir. What neighborhood was that? Was, or was that Alabama where you bought a whole city block? That was Alabama. And it wasn't a whole city block. It was like a half. And it wasn't a big block, but it was big enough for me. You know what I mean? It had a building on it. And uh, But before that, I bought land in uh, West Side Atlanta, Dixie Hills, Bankhead, where T.I. and them from. And they were selling houses for 12000 8000 ugly beat-up houses this 2010. I, I was there for two years. I bought my first house for twenty-five thousand for my homeboy. He bought ten houses. I'm like, damn, you only uh, twenty-eight years old, and I'm out here struggling in the bay, 
paying this rent and you down here owning 10 houses. He like, bro, you should leave, you know, come to Atlanta, boy, because it's like you can own a house and the music popping. And Zaytoven, that's my little brother. I taught Zaytoven how to make beats. He knew how to and play keyboard. very influential down there. Yes. When, and then I just said, forget it, man. I moved in the house. I paid the rent. I remember it was $1,000. I moved out there with 2000 to my name. I just knew I was going to the right place. I didn't know exactly how I was going to make it. But I had a magazine that me and Snoop started called Mandatory Business. I said, I got to get my first customers. I got some samples to show the magazine. Because at that time, magazine still was popping. Mm -hmm. But I had to get people to believe in my magazine and pay me so I could press the magazine up. I remember it took me about four months to get my first customer. Once I made that first hundred dollars, I said, boy, I'm never gonna forget you. You the beginning stages of me being independent in Atlanta. My first hundred dollar transaction off of something I'm selling and it ain't dope. Mm. I'm gonna put this nigga at, give him his own page in my magazine. It costs $5,000 for 5,000 full color magazines uh, UV coating, 80, 80, 80 pound paper, uh, 60 pages, you know, I know my math. I'm selling pages for 100, 200. I'm selling the front cover for two, 3,000. I sell it for 1,000 because I can give you your copies with you on the front and give another guy his with his covers on the front. So my, 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 my printer was working with me and that's how I was able to have the extra money to feed my family. And then my catalog was going through digital distribution, paying me a check every 30 days. So I, I balanced them two things together and that's how I was able to maintain and build up some money. But I'm like, I can't keep paying no thousand dollars of rent. I'm gonna buy this house for 25,000. I built up enough, I gave them half, I was giving them 2000 here, 1500 you know, till it was paid off. The land across the street, they wanted 9000 about a little less than an acre, directly across the street. I'm like, if I buy this, boy, I'm finna be on. The man agreed to sell it to me. Now I got a house and I got this land right in the middle of the hood of fucking all this gang shit, dope dinner. I'm talking about this is, but I'm like, shit, I feel right at home because this is my house and this is the shit they say you supposed to shoot somebody for. Now, if nobody bothered me here, I'm good. But I remember the first niggas that came and I remember they was breaking in the train and my wife called me because I put cameras up and say, babe, it's two niggas outside in front of the house. They looking at the train. I say, I'm on my way. I come back over there. I'm like, hey, bro, I bought this house and this property right here. Woo woo. They're like, yeah, man, we, we on the train. I say, nah, that's cool. You know, but my wife, calling me, bro, y'all on the side of my house right here, you feel me? Like, man, we've been robbing trains for here for years. But I say, bro, I got kids and shit up in the wood. He like, man, I say, all right, stay right here. I went to the house, got my strap, came out. The nigga said, come on, bro, let's start walking. They start walking down the street. I just start shooting in the air. Wow, 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 wow. Don't never come back up here no more, nigga. <laughs> Because, boy, to have my wife call me and I got right. babies yeah, in this house. Yeah, you got to protect Man, me. and I'm in a new hood. This is my first altercation. I say, nigga, at my house, I'm shooting. So I just want a nigga to know. Now, I know they could have came back, did whatever. Run hip, I'm like, nigga, this is my land, though, nigga. This is mine. I'm going all gas, no brakes. A couple of the OGs saw what happened. They told them niggas, man, fall back from that nigga up there, bro. Because he up there, he going to shoot. But he ain't been bothering nobody around here. You feel me? So I started meeting more niggas. Then we all kind of got cool. But I just, that was my introduction. Yeah, because yeah. I know that some of one of the films you had, all of them dudes, if you really wanted to, you could have probably signed, um, what's the boy's name that got hot as fish grease down there? Young Thug, Young Migos. Thug, Young Thug, the Migos, all them. You had future. all them kids in your movies. Having, meeting them dudes, they all was just in the area. I'm just a, a people person, so I'm a network. The young niggas like, Fig, you should work with him. I'm like, damn, this nigga looks strange as hell, this Young Thug character. Bro, fuck with him, bro. The people love him, bro. Like, he's somebody. I'm telling you, fuck with him. So I started fucking with him. I looked past the weird shit. And, you know, he was cool. Our music and the shit we did, it was impactful. The Migos, when Gucci Man, me and Gucci Man did the album, he signed some dudes called the Migos. But they was getting in so much trouble, offsetting them, going to jail, different shit. Then Gucci Man ended up going to jail. So he sold them to QC, P. They had another label at that time. But when they signed Migos, they said these guys is good enough to put the real bag behind. 
they started a new label called QC. And then that shit took flight. So just being part of this, you know, I remember paying Future 3500 to come do my birthday party. That was in 2013. I was turning 40 years old. I had been in Atlanta for three years. My name was going up. I got some money coming in. It's like I'm getting planted into the, into the, the environment. I did so much work, niggas start thinking I was from Atlanta. How I had motion going down there, how I'm moving and moving through them blocks, I'm doing all them. They like, man, who is this nigga? It's just I wasn't scared. It wasn't that I'm tough or a gangster or nothing. Right. It was just that I'm so hood orientated and I'm so comfortable with God and myself. I'm not here to cause a problem, but I know jealousy or a nigga pressing me about being in their hood, it can happen at any moment. So I already signed up for it. A nigga press me, I'm pressing back. If the nigga get on me, I'm getting on the nigga back. And from them time, my first altercations, and niggas seeing how I responded, it's like, it wasn't like, they could have piled up on me, like, nigga, you got to get up out of here. Nigga, you can't fight back. Nah, nigga, that's between me and this nigga. So most times the hood never added they self. Mm -hmm. You know, niggas going to disagree or yeah, somebody try to run off with some or a nigga done stole some. You know, like different little shit where right. you getting your manhood tested. It ain't worth crashing out, but sometimes shit happen that can make it easy to make you be like, man, I'm finna crash out on these niggas. But that wasn't, I didn't go down there for that. I went down there for success. Because you, did, you, you had an altercation down there because you got shot down there. Yeah, you? I got shot two different times. Both of them attempted robberies that I wasn't just agreeing to. Because I know once you get robbed, nigga, that's it. Hang up, hang up your street shit. You, is new. you a lunch meal now. Every nigga who was somebody who had a little status, and once they got robbed, they start becoming a target with multiple robberies now, multiple attempts, niggas testing them. Both mines, I wasn't going. And then I wasn't tough. I just already signed up for it. Like, bro, don't just because a nigga got a gun don't mean because a nigga point, you're supposed to just hair up and gear your shit up. Sometimes it ain't no bullets in the motherfucker. It's a 50-50 chance, but when somebody that you show love to try to rob you, you might resist a little bit more. Like, bro, what is you doing, bro? I'm robbing you today. Robbing me today? Right. You know, imagine a nigga you've been fucking with two, three years, and one day he say, bro, I'm robbing you today. Hmm. I'm like, hold on. The nigga like, what? The nigga, bro, they kept asking me for the money. Now, a real robber a shoot you in the leg, say, bitch ass nigga, this ain't no game, nigga, come on with it. Okay, you know what it is. But when the nigga like, bro, you got to give us something. For 10 damn near 15 minutes of asking, this ain't a robbery, nigga. Y'all really trying to rob me for my manhood. So that I could be able to say, we robbed feed. But what ended up happening, I just kept praying to Allah, the one, Master, Master Farah Muhammad, the one, Minister Farrakhan, told us, brother, pray to, to the, how we pray, how Elijah Muhammad pray, how you think we protected. Allah real, you got to call on him. But you can't depend on him when you think you just in trouble. You got to talk to him beforehand and you got to do some good so i was feeding people i'm trying to go do the good work all that mm -hmm. imagine me feeding people and right after i feed then niggas come talking about the robbery shit. but i've been in here for three four years mm -hmm. so i could have gave it up all they had to do was hit me in the head a couple times with the pistol then i would have gave it up it wasn't that it was the demand with the pistol and the words and the threat of it mm -hmm. i had a baby the day before there was no way possible I'm going back to the hospital or bringing my wife home with my brand new daughter and all my kids. I got robbed for our money. And what's so cool, he put all that in the movie. <laughs> I had to. That's how I knew about it. It was like the real life thing. Right. You saw us on? Mm -hmm. My real guts, the real surgery, the real morphine and, oh, we got to do emergency surgery. They got their cameras out. I'm like, well, fuck that. Give me my camera. <laughs> Cause I ain't dead right now. I don't know what's finna happen, but I know y'all got y'all hands in my guts and nobody gonna believe that my stomach split open like this and they in there talking about, we gotta stop the bleeding. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, shit, let me put this on my, that was just another thing of my type of mentality of. Turn it into something. Turn it into you gotta something turn your pain mm -hmm. and your ill into something. Mm -hmm. If you do that, that's the most powerful thing is a man who his wife left him or something, and now he got to use that pain to go further. Or the homies betrayed you, like, nah, not the bros. Like, yeah, the bros played me, bro. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can't call on them no more. You actually got to do it on your own. That'll drive a nigga to become successful. Exactly. Mm -hmm. 
Didn't DJ Quick say something in his song about he had his homies or something in the studio or something, and he came back, the studio was gone. Yep. He's like, oh, shit, I'm going to make me a way Born better album. Born and raised in Next thing you know, he got a whole new hit record. And it's always those closest to you because you seem to always be in the right place at the right time because I heard one of my partners was telling me, I don't know, I don't remember where I heard it from actually, but when P was in the Bay and he first started doing his thing, wasn't nobody really messing with him. They said you was the first one to step up and say, you know what, I'm going to fuck with this dude. He I'm going to give him a chance because he was garbage and I'm going to keep it real. He became a better artist that we appreciated. But in the beginning, like, bro, that ain't it. Them songs ain't it. Them beats ain't it and the way he rapping. You know, he from New Orleans, so he had to. Right. We wasn't used to a, a rapper with a different voice, first of all. That's number one. You got a whole the different. sound was different. Everything was. Just, was we not. wasn't used to that not coming out of our section. We was used right. to it coming from. So we looked at him as one of us. We didn't know you born and raised down there. You the gangster. You a real gangster. You a real gang member from nigga, the Calio Projects. When I worked it with him and put the stamp and showed him how to go get his graphics done, how to go get his, uh, uh, t how to put the album covers on the inside if you got something new, put it on the inside. I taught him all of that. He used the hell out of that for many years. And listen, <laughs> and that was a beautiful He was the king of that. Billion uh, albums coming out. And inside. that concept, yeah. I'm the first person to put out 10 albums in one year. Hustle that till I'm major. Hustle till I'm major. You feel me? <laughs> so that being in the right place at the right time, I think what it is is giving a person that looked like an underdog a chance right. at the right time, like the rapper of the game. It was 400 rappers. Minister Farcon said, I want all the rappers to come see me with me and Russell Simmons. We want to talk to you all about the independent game, how not to get tricked in the industry, uh, some more knowledge about the hidden hand and the plots and plans, you know, so that we could look out and watch out. When I walked in that room, it was 400 rappers in this room. He the only rapper that I got the phone number from and said, this the next motherfucker for the West Coast. I'm the first person to say it, but for it to actually happen, that was, and, 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 and I was hurt I wasn't part of it, but I was happy to know that my skill set worked. I told the world, I put him with Nas Escobar on QB to Compton. Me and Daz Dillinger just did Long Beach to Filmo. So off that buzz, finding a new artist, how do I launch him? My man's had eight unreleased Nas songs. I say, man, let me get them songs. I'm going to blend it with my new artist, The Game, and call it QB to Compton, Nas and The Game. To the people, it looked like they together. But Nas was having beef with Jay-Z with Ether and... Uh, whatever them two songs, them niggas was going back mm -hmm. and forth. Right in the middle of that beef is when I dropped the game shit. And it made them hot as fish grease. Nas was on the cover of Double XL. On that cover is the game, the Black Wall Street shit that I had, and the albums that I got coming out. The next issue, 50 Cent, Dr. Dre, Eminem on Double XL cover. If I would have waited one more month to put me an ad out, because I went with the Nas because it was hot, I didn't know Dr. Dre and them was finna grab 50 Cent and it was finna be a cover that was their biggest cover ever. But long yeah. story short, finding game and marketing him in the Double XL on a national scale, he was able to take the songs that I paid for and go shop around and then do new songs of the mixtape circuit. He went and got his own deal. I can't claim that. He went yeah. he went for when I came up and stayed with you. <laughs> Small world. It is. Small world. <laughs> that that whole concept That was crazy. That, that was whole crazy. concept how that really happened. People got to say JT the first he predicted it. I can say it was for sure. I just said he is the prototype. He, 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 he tall, he rapping like fabulous. He sound like shine, but he talking LA gangbang raps. To me, I thought, I'm like, this is him. Oh yeah, for sure. That was and then he became that. So when I work with Young Thug, this is years later. This is, this is, me and Game was 2002. Me and, me and Thug was 2012. So like 10 years later, I take a chance. He ended up becoming something great. Me and Future, I bring Future out here 
you know, we bring the Migos to the Bay. They like, who the hell is these guys, man? Mm -hmm. Two months later, man, bro, bro, what, man, give me the give me Quavo number. Give, I say, bro, I brought Future. Y'all didn't care nothing about the future, the Migo or Young Thug. But as soon as they hit the radio station out here, that's when everybody like, man, that's who the dudes big brung out here. JT brung them dudes, man. Oh, they in the movie with, oh, that's the same dudes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. You didn't, one thing about it, though, you had recorded a lot of songs with the game. You owned the masters. Correct. Okay, so you was able to get some retribution then. I had to go, I had to go do it. I know Wack 100, he wasn't happy, you know, all these years later saying that I was stupid. But I was like, I told Game, give me 250000 When I went to Aftermath, first of all, told them, bring them the masters and a copy of my contract. They seen it. They, they, they said it's authentic, but we don't want to buy this album. We working on a new album. And if we buy this album from you, it's going to come out of Game's budget, and he don't want to authorize that. But if he wanted to get me out the way, that was what the smart thing to do. He didn't want to see me get no money at all. Like, oh, that shit is old, man. That shit ain't nothing. Then I went straight to Koch, sold it to them. Mm. Game that called me good. before I sold it and said, I give you 75000 and just go away. I said, I don't want seventy-five. I want two fifty. That's a fair number. Nigga, they just gave you all this money. You with the biggest people in the world. Two fifty ain't nothing. So when, when WAC 100 did an interview not too long ago, he was saying JT was stupid for that. I said, well, first of all, I invested $12,000 to do all them songs. Studio time, hotel, bitches for them, for a couple outfits, some weed, 12 bands, 40 songs. All I wanted was 250000 I ended up making, over the life of that album, over $5 million. Mm because I sold it to Koch before digital kicked in. And then when digital kicked in, I took the album back from Koch and I put it back out and then I get to check every month. They thought I was stupid. I wasn't that stupid, nigga. I only signed for albums and records and cassette tapes. I didn't sign for iTunes and Spotify. And most people, now they try to send season to season, but I'm like, man, I ain't listening to that shit. I got the shit loaded up. This my shit. Game can't say nothing to white men, not no, no prejudice shit. But they was talking to white man power shit, JT, JT. Th I say, hold on, man, I didn't sign it. That, it don't say iTunes on my contract. It don't say nothing about streaming. It only say records, cassette tapes, vinyl for distribution worldwide. And they could have kept doing it if they wanted to, but you go take the digital rights and do what you want to do. Because with them. digital, I don't even care about a cassette tape or a CD no more. Once it right. went to that, I, I was smart. I'm like, shit, boy, I'm going digital. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not arguing with them about how many tapes did we sell, how many we shipped, they lying. You know how the record label. Oh, definitely. Oh, we shipped this and we paid for that and we, oh, man. Reserves. Yeah, you ain't recouped yet. <laughs> and then Reserves. we got a whole 80% reserve. Yeah. Man, if you don't get up out of here with this game, shout out to digital. Whatever money been made, they take their cut, send you your rest. I like that. Now, if they scam it, it's working because I, I like a check every month. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It don't even got to be a big one. It just got to be a check. Mm -hmm. And it ain't even a check. It's a direct deposit. So on the first of the month, everybody with digital accounts, we all feel happy. Because mm -hmm. whatever's in it, something is on your, in your bank account. So why do a lot of niggas hate digital? They hate digital for the lack of the quick turnaround time. Based upon putting your shit out digitally, there isn't a revenue that comes in for months, a lot of times, even if you just pay for promotion. Imagine you spend $30,000 on promo of your new album and you spend 10,000 recording it and making it. And so you had about 40, maybe 10 more. So you had like a 50. That album might not do nothing. You might be make $1,000 on the first month, if that. Mm -hmm because it still take time to catch, unless you a person with a buzz already. So niggas without that buzz, you not finna be getting no 10 bands every month or no 15 bands yet. It's not gonna happen. If you put your album out and, on, and you thinking you about to make all the money from one album, then you're mistaken. If you're not working your YouTube channel in conjunction with your digital distribution deal, which also feeds your digital distribution deal. But if you, if you turn on your YouTube account properly, then your digital distribution check money 
from this particular stream goes to that and then another YouTube check comes to you personally as the YouTube owner. But if you sign your whole YouTube over also, then you don't get that. That's another downside to um, artists. When you have a hot song, it ain't just paying no DJ to play your song or pay for a playlist. These are the other elements that I watch companies do, like Empire, Orchard. If a song that you are trying to push, they will load it on a YouTube channel four, five, six, seven different ways. The extended version, the audio version where the words is coming on, the actual video version, uh, the song playing with just some random stuff happening in the background. But why do they do that? Because this random stuff has a title, but it's playing your song, but you still get credit for every spin. So that's what you call creative marketing within your streaming to make the money come in. You see what I'm saying? Um, and I have failed to do this all the way, but when I go in the back office and see they got somebody sitting there and they taking this whole album and they finna chop, they finna make this album. <laughs> it's 10 songs, they got 45 videos. <laughs> Did you just hear me? Man. It's the same album, it's 45 with creative type. The titles, lyric video, like you said. Lyric video. The lyric video, the instrumental. The, instrumental. the real video. Yeah, the, 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 the dirty lyrics video. with the clouds. The, the, yeah. the cloud the version. That's the lyric the video. video. Yes. The other emotional. Vi other videos to the motherfucking song. It won't even be the video. It'll just be some clips of you Man. cut up. And it'd be like. And that is the other part that most rappers is not doing and or the label who has the rapper. And you can't forget about the fan videos because fans now will sit up there and make videos that you line up with You get credit your for yeah. yours, but yeah, that money comes to you too. Mm -hmm. If you register properly. Did you hear that? Yeah, if you ever the registration of the is, song. It's very important. Because your YouTube money and your streaming money, on my, on my YouTube account, I had not set it up right. So if I play one song, it could be my song, all the money from this video go to that one song, even if it only come on for 10 seconds. If that song played within your YouTube or anybody's song. So I was like, how come I'm not getting my YouTube credit, but it's going to the distributor? Because I want my YouTube money kind of like to come to me. But my man's was like, you got to set it up right. I want my YouTube money to come to me, and I want the distributor money because that check come to me too. But I want exactly. my shit to be separate because you're supposed to get paid off your views. You know what's YouTube. funny? You know what's funny about you saying that? I told him I managed rapper named Glasses Malone, and um, I told him I said, "Bro, you ain't never got a check from your YouTube channel." He got videos on there getting million Tupac must die, two million yeah. views, right? Million views. He didn't on even there. get that check. And I said, "Dog, I asked the distributor. I said, why are you claiming videos?" off of this, you didn't upload this, you didn't do it. Well, you know, we part of his distribution. He uploaded that himself, you didn't do no work for they that. They got he access to the channel. So we got that fixed. We got everything snatched from them and got them snatched off of there and now he getting his checks now. I said, bro, that's all your money. I told eight the same thing. I told eight when I saw his channel, I said, bro, you got this up there, you need to have MC8 on there. So I'm in the process now of going to go get all these other 2,500 fake MC8 pages to where somebody probably been paying their house note, car note, and everything else for the past few years. You know, dinner time is over now. Now, nah, dinner time got to be over because the proper registration is only a mistake of an artist. The lack of adding them that one album with 10 songs, but on YouTube, <laughs> that thing got 45 different variations that all pay, it pays the person. Yeah. It pays. So, it's people that have a song and all they got is girls booty shaking from YouTube or from Instagram. You know how they got the girls to do right. that. They take them videos, but the audio is what the distributor is claiming. But this video, whoever owned the YouTube channel, that portion of the money goes to, so it's a separate. But there's guys that's all they doing is putting booty girls on a fucking song. Yep. And the, and I'm like, bro, this, these girls ain't dancing to this song, but the way they edit it. They mixed it. Yeah, they, they, they mixing it. Like it's, like it's a part of the song. Yeah. 200,000 views. Whole game. Mm -hmm. If the booties wasn't on there, I don't think it probably would have did them numbers. Exactly. But since them booties on there, it's the same song, but it's a, it, it, it got the booties playing. 
that concept or a gangster song and you see hella shootings or something. Somebody got the drive-bys or something, you know, like the gangster rapper. He's showing clips from off that they downloaded, but his song is playing. That concept is like, you could take your whatever last album you put out and do that same concept right now with just video visuals with your music playing on the channel. Mm -hmm. cool. And when you load it Make up, money don't put it. nothing in between a different video of something else. Nope. Take the day or two or however long to fill it up so you can release them and they all stay in order. Mm -hmm. Like you didn't put nothing else in between. It's like a bundle pack for you you representing this album again, but it have a whole other video that it might be you, might not be you. I'm liking it to back in the day. Remember how we used to do the maxi singles? You do a single, you might have two or three remixes yeah, on yeah, that yeah, motherfucker. Definitely. Then you might have another version with you rapping on there. You feel what I'm saying? It's exactly. a maxi single. Or a feature. Repurposing, yeah. Yep. Repurposing yep. the thing. You know what it, it remind me of, man? I remember, shout out to the homies that rap a lot, right? I ain't going to say my man's name, so I don't want to get him in trouble. Yeah. But my man who wound up later on going to rap a lot, he was telling me we was coming from Vegas. So that's when we did the deal with High C down there at rap a lot. So we coming from Vegas, right? And he was telling me, man, I miss EMI. He used to be an exec at EMI. And he told me that, you remember at one time, everybody had million dollar budgets for videos, half million dollar budgets mm -hmm. for videos. He told me, man, that it was just him and maybe two other people worked in the LA office. So what they started doing, they had so many people submitting, you know, for music, for deals and stuff. Remember they had EMI music distribution? They would sign cast to deals, right? But there wasn't a real deal. They never recorded an album. They just let them go in the studio and they'd say, oh, this didn't work out. But in the meantime, they got a budget for it. Mm -hmm. They ran that 10, 15 times, bro. Never put out no projects. And then what he told me too that they would do, they had a, if they had a real artist, oh man, you don't sold 50, 60,000. They get a whole separate back barcode on the record, ship off 40, 50,000 copies. Dude don't know nothing about it because his sound scan say, okay, you so you scan 25. Yeah, it's a different barcode. This cool, but meantime, meanwhile, they running it up over there with the other thing. Now nah, that that back door in the music industry go back to Marvin Gaye and them and, and before him. I was about to say it's before that. Oh, because it's always it's way been back. A finesse. Right. Mm -hmm. Our generation, 1992. I remember the the news report that came out that said, uh, Biz Marquee. And Rob Bass, DJ Easy Rock, two albums that came out, they both sold a million records. The copyright infringement came in, they didn't get none of the money. Mm -mm. Joy and Pain, who was that? That's Frankie Rob Beverly. Bass. Uh, Rob okay, Bass, Frankie DJ Beverly, Easy right? Yep. They took the whole song, Frankie Beverly, and just rapped on top of it and looped it. They didn't change nothing. That is when I got scared in '92 not to rap on samples. My tape that came out in June, my man had got a couple old records and we looped it how y'all was doing y'all thing, right? Mm -hmm. When that happened, that happened around July, August. By November, December, when I dropped my tape, I'd had interpolation. So yeah. I would play something over and I never had to pay a copyright or a publisher. That's what we did. We, you know what's I dope, played man. a lot of my shit over. Once that lawsuit shit started, like you would put your album out, mm -hmm. then they come take all your money. Oh, they go wait. Oh no! I worked, I worked for a publishing company, and I remember when they was about to hit Dre and them for the one song, all these niggas and all these hoes, because mm -hmm. they had sampled. Um, what was that? Dun, 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 dun. That's motherfucking looking for that good Look stuff, stuff, nigga. Let me yeah. tell you, I back, worked back. I worked back, for, back, back, back. back. Yeah. I worked for Minder Music. They owned the publishing for that because what they did, what Minder Music did. And it was funny how karma come back on people. All the cats that robbed the Gap Band, and then Mind the Music came and got his ass, right? So they had all the Gap Oh, the record bands. label. Yeah, they, they, they had all the Gap, um, the Gap Bands published, and they had the Fatback Band. What was cold about that, though, is they had hit Aftermath up several times. They didn't want to take Trey to court, but he just kept ignoring them. Then when it came time for the actual go to court, he was in their sleep, a million dollars. Man, Dre was in there sleep. He didn't give a fuck. He got walked out like he didn't care. Like it was just a waste of his time. Cause he, cause he actually had sampled it, or he actually used it. Yeah, he actually used it. Go and give him the money, man. We still, we still mm -hmm. on tour, or so we still. Cause that's what John said. I said y'all gonna put a cease and desist. He said no. Why would I do that? This record's doing phenomenal. I said, well, when we go take him to court, he said we go wait. He said I think it's approaching platinum. Yeah, why? And why? Then yeah. the check was bigger. Yeah, he you waited. You know, uh, speaking of rap a lot, Jay Prince told me that too with the. Uh, he had signed uh, the producer Seven, 
And when he was doing all the stuff with, he was signed to rap a lot as a producer. And when he was doing all the stuff with Murder Earl Inc., Gatti and all them, yep. he was actually signed. So he said, oh, I'm going to wait till Ja Rule and Ashanti do their business. Then I'm going to go. He goes, why am I going to step to him now? That's he the game, man. Right? And people do do that, though, because Young Thug was signed to five different record labels. Yeah. When, it blew, when the big blow up yep, happened. Yep. So, you know, I'm pretty sure everybody got compensated, but I just, if if you sign a deal for this album. Everybody get a deal. <laughs> and then this producer or this executive, he fall off or they go separate ways, whatever. Another dude come like, oh, I'll put the money behind Thug. Drop a mixtape. Okay, that came out. Then that didn't work. Another guy come. I put some money up. So Thug was like, shit. Whoever got some money to put a record out. But then within that contract, though, there were stipulations that you are my artist in some form or fashion. So once he got the big deal, all the dudes that had a contract, they would know he my artist. Nah, he my artist. Right. But it's so much money involved. Them, all them dudes went away. Whatever check got handed out, mm -hmm. it just went silent. Sometimes it's just a matter of telling. Yep, them niggas like, all got that I'm money. Give you two fifty, you go get seventy five. You go get this. Yep, Sometimes yep. Sometimes just go away. You know what I mean? Hell yeah, because some people business. like shit getting two, three hundred thousand from a nigga, and you you gave him twenty five thousand two, three years ago. And now it's finna happen, and it's finna be a quarter million or something. That's, that's good money. That's a good investment. That's, that's, good all I'm, that's all I'm trying to say. That's it right there. You know what I'm saying? Go away. Don't never come back. It's over. Mm -hmm. For 250 mm -hmm. Come on with it. Yeah, let me <laughs> ask you this, bro, because you've been around for a long time. You don't saw all the incarnations of just like um, everything go from having the street team to the where it's on the internet now, man. What do you think about the climate we in now, man, to where – we actually content creators. We still up here having a constructive interview, you know, constructive conversation, right? What do you think about this era, man, where people just online wild and then doing everything now? He's on that line. I think, um, I think the internet really just opened the door for people to be show their ass. You feel me? And that will become the new content, like Jerry Springer. But now every day, all day, with random people, is Jerry Springer, and it's not just per se. The shock of, you're not the father, or you are the father. It's the nigga with the gun. It's the girl doing something nasty. It's it's anything that that's not considered your mom and dad or granny and them, you wouldn't do this in front of them. I think uh, the art of the internet and, and people longing to be famous <laughs> has made people just really go to through all kind of steps to be uh, a, a celebrity and they don't even have to be like we consider celebrities like artists like ourselves movie stars or you know famous sports figures motherfucker uh, a bitch slapping herself with a cake and shit on on instagram now mm -hmm. is, is the form of being yeah. famous that's right uh, uh, that's right uh, uh, a regular a regular person you know people do all these outrageous acts now to mm -hmm. become famous and that's because i say um our generation uh don't accept being normal anymore mm -hmm. they don't me um Back when I was a kid, you know, my uncle worked at the gas company. He was a normal motherfucker, mm -hmm. you know. He didn't have visions of, I got to be the next, you know, Wesley Snipes, or I yeah, got to be right. the next, you know, um, you know, my auntie worked as a nurse. Mm -hmm. She didn't go, well, fuck, you know. I got to start taking, I got to get in Playboy, or I got to be in Penthouse, you know. I'm, some people were just regular. Our gen, the generation now, I think because of, like you said, everything is monetized now. You get me? YouTube and OnlyFans and Instagram and everything you can make a dollar out of. And then the, the, it's ridiculous is the, the, the steps people will take. Like I said, nobody's comfortable with being normal. You get yeah, me? Wrong with going to go get a job. Because before uh, I, I discovered that I could write a song or tell a story or whatever, my visions was to be a normal motherfucker, you know, until I was introduced to the gang life and selling dope and whatever, whatever. But like I said, I, 
I didn't plan on, you know, being MC8 or being a famous whatever. Right. My father worked at General Motors. My mom's worked as a, uh, as a CNA or a nurse or whatever. So your visions of being a normal kid, that's what it was. I think now growing up with all this fucking, like you say, uh, motherfucker put a studio in his house today. Motherfucker can film movies on his phone. Uh, females can, yes. you know, go get their asses done and take pictures on Instagram and they're, they're Instagram models or now. Or get them you only know? fans playing with themselves all day. Or do, dudes get a, you, shit, you can be famous by fucking, uh, a regular motherfucker who cooked dinner for his family. Hey, do you know what I want to say then? Who single-handedly, I think, who single-handedly, uh, now when I'm hearing you say that, we got to say, look at this word, YouTube, right? Right. First, it used to be films that somebody make to, to show us. But somebody said, how about we make a platform where you going to be on the tube, the regular person? Right. I think that was a thought. Let's take the the, the camera off of uh. Let's let's create put a it place on ourselves. where we going to put the camera on the regular people and let's see what they do. Because that's crazy as hell when I just listen what you're saying. And I think before social media, it was YouTube was a big thing where you can be somebody. Right. And that's how they market it. YouTube, you, it's about you. Upload your, yourself doing yeah, your, your life. Uh, well, I'm going to give you all both some game, and I'm going to tell you what they're doing. Uh, Rupert Murdoch, I think, is the guy that owns Fox, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. What these platforms do, I'm going to tell you what YouTube's grand plan is, right? YouTube also has YouTube TV, where they have a bunch of fast channels on there, right? A bunch of channels. Black people are good for bringing attention to stuff, right? You know, we, we're consumers, right? We, a lot of us are consumers, not owners. We bring attention to stuff. So now you got guys like, let's say like our, our YouTube channel got like a couple hundred thousand people on it, right? His might have 50,000, his may have 300,000, right? When you add that up and all these millions of channels, you got people that are on there now, right? That are signed up for YouTube. If you notice, they're starting to crack down a lot of stuff. You're seeing people get their channel snatched down left and right, right? With that bullshit, okay, we're letting you go. They're building it up, bro. They're using other people to build their platform, right? And they're going to snatch all of this away from everybody else pretty soon. I'm going to tell you what's really crazy about this is that people that get caught up in YouTube, I got nieces and nephews, that's all they've been raised on is YouTube because their mama or daddy give them the tablet in the morning instead of going out taking them outside to play. Remember we used to go outside and play football, basketball and stuff? Now people just give their kid the tablet. And it makes it people to think that that's real life. That's not the real world, right? I get a lot of people that come to me because they just think I could make somebody's podcast pop. They don't understand the work that goes into it. They don't even understand the audio component on it. Me and, we make 10 times the amount of money on audio than we do on YouTube, am I right, eh? Right. Am I lying? Just talking to me. Yeah, just talking. Audio. Just audio, just plain audio. So I get people come to me because everybody thinks that, oh, it's just easy. They just up there talking. They don't know about, oh, you got to do research. You got to have something to actually converse with these people about when they come on, right? So I get people to get mad when they see me working with somebody. I don't sign everybody. I'm not, I, I don't sign people no more because it's too much of a headache because I can do no right with that. It don't matter if I change your life or not. I'm going to wind up being an asshole. I get say all that to say, I get this text message the other night from a random number. I don't know who this is. Man, why you put that ugly hoe on? I respond back with, who is this? She is trash. She boring. You should have fucked with me. Again, who is this? Man, she canceled. I just blocked the number because he hasn't revealed himself. People aren't even men nowadays in this culture because they can hide behind the screen, right? Have you ever noticed that you may have a fan that's talking shit to you? And then once you acknowledge him, like, what the fuck is it that you want, dude? I don't even know you. Oh, I just wanted to talk to you. Man, I didn't have people come on my page and say shit. And then I'm like, let me go hit this motherfucker direct. I ain't going to respond. Right. And then I go to my messages, and he didn't have messages months ago 
praising me or something that, that he wanted to interact. But this message that made me look on his page was something negative. But when I go to send him a message, it's messages that I never responded to that they were trying to work with me you on. you probably didn't even know you had. Like, I'm a bitch ass nigga though, but in my, on these messages, <laughs> man, what's up bro, hook up with me, let's connect. I'm a dudes like that just be wanting your attention. I get that sometime and then once you acknowledge because, like you said, I'm not going to get on, you know, on platform in front of everyone. So you'll go to message a motherfucker. And as soon as you say something to a motherfucker, they'll be instantly, oh, my bad, man. You know what I'm saying? I was just saying, man, you know, you know, I, totally. dig, I dig your work and, and all this. So I'm really a fan. People just be want, like I said, everybody wants their five minutes of fame. Um, you can You can watch whatever platform and you see people doing all kind of shit just to get that five minutes of fame and that's why i say nobody wants to be in this day and age nobody wants to be a regular motherfucker everybody wants to be a podcaster or an artist or or a fucking comedian or or a fucking uh content that's what they call it, content creator. content creator it, it, everything is a content creator now there's no other word for an influencer it is funny i'm an influencer me. yeah i'm an influencer and a content creator <laughs> and like you look on a motherfucker's page and you look on a female's page and they be half naked or doing the modern dance or whatever whatever and then they the go but i'm dance. an influencer yeah. you are influencing yeah. motherfuckers to be naked and <laughs> shake ass i mean that, is that, that, that's your content that you bring but they so, never f take the time out to learn the business. Everybody think because they got a YouTube channel, they got a thing. First of all, I've seen people go out and invest enormous amounts of money into YouTube, right? The first thing I tell them is say, okay, you spent $50,000 on building this elaborate set, right? Got you a building you're paying rent on every month. It's cool that you're making that YouTube money, but what happens when YouTube decides that they no longer want to fuck with this nigga snacks your shit down? Man, I went through that. I was up to almost a hundred thousand, right? About to graduate from my first plaque, and I got hit, hacked, or whatever the hell, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the second time I got my JT the Bigger Figure page took in 2016. I was at about sixty some thousand at that time, but that was good for me because for what I do, that's more than enough. Well, for what I'm selling, right? Mm -hmm. Shit, if a thousand people out of sixty thousand was tuned in, I was happy with a, just a number of people, right? When that channel got took, and I really realized how many people don't even have my direct number, and how many people I don't, I can't, I don't know their number, because I was talking to them through Instagram. Mm -hmm. You know, that was my way of communicating. Losing that shit is losing your money. Yep. Yeah. Losing your account is losing your money. Mm -hmm. So part of why I have this Traplix app right now. Trap flicks for me is is something I can continue to upgrade now. But going to Africa, I found the developers because I said in the very near future, you're gonna have to have your own platform because they gonna they gonna community guidelines you to death if you say this or if you don't they don't agree with yeah, something. Someone talked about that earlier. Yeah. Like nigga, hold on, I just repost somebody's shit. How I'm getting flagged over some I, I thought it was dope or I mm -hmm. thought it was this. Nope, that's against our community guidelines. I say, oh no. In a minute they gonna charge us to go live because that's too much access. We not taking advantage of posting shit. Watch when it tighten up and it costs money to post. Well, you know and you got to put credits on your account. Exactly. You can't go live. You ain't got no more credits. That's about to happen, boy. If right now they told all of us it's $19.99 right now to have a deluxe you, uh, Instagram account where you can still go live, we'll all pay the $19. If they got a billion subscribers, they can just make $20 billion in one month because nobody's going to say, oh, I don't want my Instagram account no more. You're going to pay that it's money. It's like when they start opening it up for motherfuckers to buy the blue checks, which I thought was ridiculous. I said, and you saw everybody the ego, the blue checks. The ego of the person. Mm -hmm. Listen, did you know when you go, listen, bro, at down south, world star hip hop was very important to your campaign. Live mixtapes, world star. Two components that you pay to put your album to get your buzz, right? $1,000 to put your video on Worldstar on the regular box. Hella people paying 1000 to get their video. You want to be on the big box, the middle box next one up, 3500 
You want to pay for the bigger box, $5,000, $6,000, $7,000, and you can be guaranteed to make a million plays or whatever, right? And I look at everybody who drop in the, in the big box always land at a million, 1.2, 1.5. Little did we know, no, it ain't just because it's a bigger box. They got an algorithm set up on this box that's going to hit a million views. So we, like me paying for that, those are the bragging rights down south is how many views you got. Oh, you on the big box. Okay, he got, his shit must be popping. Okay. We pay for the ego of being able to say that I got a million views. I don't hear people talking about paying for world stars like how I used to hear, but that was a way to get your, your, your video out. Mm -hmm. J JT, this brings me to a question. A lot of what you've been talking about is different cities, different states, different eras. What made you want to and actually move so much and be in so many different places? Because so many people stay in one area their whole life. I think what I learned is that the mistake I made and the, and the win that Master P made is that even though his kickoff for Master P was the Bay Area, it wasn't down south first. It was right. us. Mm -hmm. But he saw this ain't big enough and it's other places that we can go that we can have an impact. And his money could go further down there. And he's going to be able to... To become something that's not there. Mm -hmm. And that is the mistake that I made. Mm -hmm. I never forget Master P, Silk the Shocker, C Murder, King George. They pull up to my house. They going on a promo run to go to Milwaukee, Tennessee, Oklahoma. It's about 10, 12 days. And they invited me to come. And I could only remember paying Master P $5,000 to just take my posters and my flyers and put them up wherever he put his shit up at. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he did or not. We paid him the 5000 <laughs> That was a big fucking mistake because I would have been known in them places if I just would have did the promo. But since it wasn't paid and Pete talking about going on a promo tour, it didn't sound exciting to me. That was a big mistake. When I saw his results in sales in all these other little country towns and different places, and these are places that I should have went to go at least do a campaign run, I didn't know nobody in none of these other cities. But Master P knew these people from going on the promo run. So I was seeing the results of that through the priority deal, how it helped him to be national because he drove to them places and passed out shirts and tapes and CDs and put up posters. Yeah. And that mistake, in 2010, I finally left the Bay Area. Many years later, that's like, what, 15 years later, I finally dined on me. JT, you got to get out the Bay, bro. Just because I'm big out here, that shit don't mean nothing. This ain't bringing no income for me. Mm -hmm. I had to go. So going to Atlanta was a challenge. It was difficult. But the reward is I got a fresh kickoff in the rap game again brand new from scratch. It was like I was a new artist. They didn't know how old I was. They didn't really know the level of... Same thing happened with Short when he moved to Atlanta. Now, that's the other thing. Too Short moved out to Atlanta and got a brand new start. Yeah. Fucking with Lil John and them. E-40 moved to Atlanta and got a new start. That's Oakland, that's Vallejo. I represent Frisco. So 40 moved to Atlanta? Yeah, he stayed out there for about two years. Yeah. Fucking with Lil John and Too Short. He was doing my get a report card. Yep. i never forget it. Like, damn. 40 Water came back harder when he came back. Yeah. Too Short came back with the vengeance. Mm -hmm. But he left because that war that was happening in Oakland was deadly, and he didn't want to be no parts of that shit. He took himself up out of that. And I had to do the same thing. War happening in my area. Like, man, I ain't part of this war. My hood, my, all my bros that, that we loved each other, now they all want to kill each other and then started doing it. And I'm like, man, I ain't part of this shit. I'm taking Phil Mo with me. Y'all can have Phil Mo the gang. I'm gonna I'm go make Phil Mo the game, independent game. <laughs> we, right. Yeah, we gonna be known, I want Phil Mo to be known as what used to be us, hella entrepreneurs. Then it went to gang banging and killing. Gang banging and killing have dominated us for the last damn near 15, 20 years. No motion of, entrepreneurs taking flight from our projects 
The best thing happened from our hood so far is the mayor of San Francisco, London Breed, is from Filmo out of our projects. Let's do it. So that's the biggest example of somebody who come from a real project. Like she went to fucking our school, everything with us. She the fucking mayor now. That should make some other people who want to go in that vein. You know, I don't want politics, but just for somebody from the projects. Now I know the dude, she was, she was uh, playing a position and the, and the current mayor had died. She was the closest person to the mayor. And I guess the people said, how about give her a chance? And then some other people with bigger money, like, nah, we don't want her. But the people remember her from being with the, the mayor that died. She fuck around, got the job. That's dope as hell, man. That's a dope story, huh? Hell yeah. Exactly. He died, and she wasn't lined up to be no mayor. She knew all the business of how the fucking thing run, because she was under the mayor. She knew how the city worked. She worked. learned the business. She knew all the ins and outs. And all the community and, trusted her. And they, they trusted her. So, yeah. And they trusted her. So man, before we wrap it up over here, man, I want to ask you this, man. Do you get a lot of cats wanting you to consult for them? Ever since the No Jumper interview, mm. I think the No Jumper interview, and this is crazy to me, the whole time I was in Africa, I've never saw a black American rapper or even a black American go to the slums of Africa and do what the fuck I did. I built three water wells. I'm feeding thousands of people. Do you know it was zero press on me? Nobody highlighted. Man, this motherfucker JT is in the fucking Burkina Faso. They blowing the buses over here. They killed 14 villagers over there. Meanwhile, I'm like, man, you could die in America at a gas station, nigga. This seemed most safer to me with terrorist attacks in Africa than being in Atlanta, Georgia, or LA, or San Francisco because of the murder rate and the robbery. Nigga will see this watch and lose their whole life over just this watch right now. Or some earrings, or, or even your shoes damn near. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the consultation part of me successfully doing that Africa shit and coming back and now for 10 months I've been back in America. The No Jumper shit was the first thing to highlight me, a big platform to say, JT, bro, uh, my people, you know, Item 22 hit me. I've been wanting to go on there, I just didn't know how. Fuck around, he hit me direct, talking about, man, my people say I need to talk to you mm -hmm. and get you in here. They telling me you got a story that ain't been told and I need to, I need to be, I'm like, damn, that's crazy. Fucking right. He like, I need you here in three days. I'm like, I'm coming. I drove from Atlanta to come here. But my folks, and I felt it was gonna be good too, right? I say, bro, this shit gonna seem like a fake ass story. But it's a real story because it seemed too good to be true. All the elements of my life and what I've been through. And I have a nonstop career of 31 years from from June 92 to right now. I never went to sell dope again, even though a few thirsty moments. Niggas had a few pounds. Yes, I did. I did grab a few pounds. The profit wasn't good, and I didn't like that. I said, nigga, I can go to jail for these pounds, nigga, and that's all the profit off each pound? Mm -hmm. Oh, no. I, I, that's a movie in itself, man. Exactly. You know, before we go, man, I want to ask you just one more question, man. Tupac, I think people forget a lot of times he's from the Bay. He's a Bay dude, you know, came up with Ray Love and all them cats. Shout out Ray Love, the homeboy Ant Dog, and all them cats, right? They finally, man, done what the streets knew for years, right? They put Keefe D in jail. What, how many years later? 20, 26. 26 oh, years 96, later. Yeah. Do you think this is a publicity stunt? Do you even think it makes sense? Do you know every podcast I just went on, they said something about it? And look at my answer to that. I think that shit fake in some kind of way, because why would you do something that you know there's no statute of limitations, right? I think he got paid to say he was in that car, bro. Now the streets, being in LA, mm -hmm. JT, nah, it's confirmed. I say, but why would he go tell this shit and then keep trying to confirm that he handed a gun at a murder of a famous clout or he got paid? It's either he wanted the credit of this shit so bad because they said something about he got immunity. Tell us who killed Tupac. 
Orlando Anderson, he's dead. Woo -woo. Okay, K should be close, right? So that is probably what gave him more strength or confidence to talk to V-Lad that we all know. Whatever you say on that motherfucker, you, 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 got to, you got to stand on that. Then they say he wrote a book where he detailed it again. I say, bro, that shit can't be real. What street nigga going to say they did the shit, right? It's money involved. Okay, well, how? Well, here go another theory that's going around that you probably heard. He's so mad at P. Diddy, nigga, for not getting his money. He don't mind going down if he could take P. Diddy down. You think Diddy might go to jail for this shit? If it's true. Because how do you supposed to give me a million dollars in a nigga, you get a million dollars to he run off. So does that mean P. Diddy paid? Because the money didn't make it to him. So how could he go down for it if the other nigga ran off with the money? Yeah, but that make him almost like if this is all true, that makes him a conspirator. A co -conspirator. Yeah, ain't a conspiracy, man. I don't, I, I don't know what it is. So yeah, it's crazy, know, it's man. It's crazy. Where can people get at you at, bro? Man, they could get at me. First of all, I would ask anybody who watched this interview if you want to support me, man. I'm about to be 50 years old in a few more days, God willing. I said I don't want to be rapping at 50. So I want to be like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. Both of them started out with not that much. Both of them didn't graduate, but they got a hold to some coding. Bill Gates didn't write Microsoft. Another person did, and he bought it, and once you could buy the intellectual property, you can have engineers build on it, right? Steve Jobs didn't write the Apple code. Steve Wozniak is the other Steve that you don't hear about. He the one that wrote it. So what did I learn from these two dudes? Buy my own codes for software so that I can be able to license my software and grow from that. So I want everybody to download my app, Traplix. Man, I'm proud. I just got it back going. Shout out to my people in Nairobi, Kenya, all the developers who developed it for me because it's original coding. That means that if you guys ever have a problem with the app you get made and you like this new version of what I got, I can license this over to you. You can take... definitely build after this show, bro, because yeah. y'all going to be able to find a link for Trap Flicks down below, right there in the description. Go in the description. iOS and platform and on the Google Android phone, we'll have, and it's free. We will have the Google platform and the iOS platform down there. And you JT, the bigger figure, the Instagram. Them two things right there, man, that's how we tap in. And I appreciate y'all boys, man, for oh, having sure, me, JT. Sure, for nah, sure. real shit. Hey, listen, sure. I told my man, I said, I'm supposed to go back to the bay, but I remember me and you talked. I said, I better text you. Talk, I said, man, what it was, <laughs> somebody told them, they said, you know how the internet is. Why you couldn't go on a black platform? I don't know why they be just. And I said, well, yeah. I said, well, he said, none of the brothers invited me. I said, hey, man, we black over here. <laughs> Listen, that's why I'm like, oh, yeah, I forgot. <laughs> I did have somebody. That's why I had to come down here and make show. But the thing is, I, I hit your up. inbox. I wouldn't go because you know how the internet is. They want to get all involved in this stuff. Yeah. Right. You know what I'm nope, saying? No, you hit me I direct. Said, I said, and I told you, I said, nah, no disrespect. You did. I forgot. Mm -hmm. yes, and cool. I didn't know, remember, I didn't know who you was yet. I didn't know if this, you was real. When we was pulling up, I said, man, let me get my pistol out real quick, make sure these are the real guys, because I didn't know. Yeah, remember, I don't know your face. <laughs> but when you say eight, I'm like, well, I know that eight. That man right there, he had been like, man, you got to call JT, because he stay on the internet, man. Okay, he knows. He, he stay on the internet. <laughs> all day. I, I appreciate all him, day. too. Salute, my G. All day. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, brother, nah, man. Um, and, and, and whatever knowledge that I did get, because what you was showing me, you already, y'all already own it, but I want to give you what I got from Africa. Yeah, for sure. That's what I want to give it to you. you. I don't want nothing for it. I want to give you the information. And I guarantee whatever information y'all already got, you're going to be able to balance some shit out and be like, oh, we didn't have this piece or that piece because or that Because in piece. a minute, bro, None of this stuff is gonna be available on YouTube outside of clips. He could tell you. I'm taking my 20, shit off too. I, I spent twenty four thousand um, dollars. How many years ago was that, Brian? I was doing a one app. Only to realize I didn't have enough money to do it yet. So I didn't look at that twenty four thousand as a waste. I looked at it as an education. Right. You know a, a, what I'm saying? Education, because that's exactly I ran through, brother. When you dealing with software. That is more cutthroat than the goddamn dope game and the rap game put together. Oh, you, you know why? Money back. Because the person who's developing, you got to give him access to your server. 
So that's passwords. You got to get them access to your Apple developer account and your Google developer mm -hmm. account. They got to have passwords. So when they building something that you're paying for, anything you unsatisfied with, they already yeah. planted in your hey, sheet. We, we ain't gonna get these cats listening to okay, us. Okay, okay, yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah. We're gonna talk about that all. My fault. I'm we forgot. gonna get up out of here. We will see y'all next week. We out. So Make sure y'all hit the link Come below. Take this picture real quick, Carlos. And also, and also. The Gangsta Chronicles merch coming out next week. Designed yeah, we by my man it. MCA. Yeah. This is Gangsta Chronicles. We gon' tell you how it goes. Uh, if I lie, my nose will grow like Pinocchio. We gon' tell you the truth and nothing but the truth. Gangsta Chronicles.